this is part three of the spectacular legend of the Rio Grand Southern Narrow Gauge Railroad. Howdy there, I'm Zane Lewis, and today I'll be continuing the legend of Colorado's Rio Grande Southern Railroad, one of the best railroads in America. For more than 60 years, its train serviced the important mining and ranching towns of the San Juan Mountains along a majestic 160 mile long route, becoming the difference between boom and dust for many of these towns. How was this line founded? What hardships did it suffer through? And what led to its demise? Previously, in parts 1 and 2 of this series, we covered the line's founding in the 1880s to 1910, and today, we'll pick up right where we left off and rediscover the story of the line's operations in the 1910s and 20s through World War I, the Spanish Flu, and the Great Depression. The Rio Grande Southern story in the 1910s began on January 6, 1910, when locomotive number 18 derailed while approaching the Butterfly Trestle, damaging bridge timbers while falling down the embankment. Despite the engine being seriously damaged, the crew escaped with limited injuries. On the 31st, RGS locomotive number 12 hit a broken rail on the Bilk Trestle and fell off. With the train's crew pinned down by the wreckage at night, a Denver and Rio Grande train ran over the damaged trestle and came crashing down onto the RGS engine. Al Bickford, who was the 12's engineer, would pass away the next day while his fireman dealt with broken bones and skulls. Sometime that year, the Porter coal mine was destroyed by arson and the Southern dismantled its yards there in 1912. The Primos Chemical Company built a reduction plant at Newmire, which would later be called Vanadium, and a town was constructed around the mill. The Vanadium which the mill gave the world was put to work strengthening steel. Aside from the mill, the company also owned between 30 to 40 mining claims along the nearby river. On March 21st, the Telluride Roundhouse had its doors replaced, among other changes. Prior to this, snow and rain had been able to get into it for several years. On June 22nd, the Dead Horse Gulch Bridge burned, which forced a six-hour delay for incoming RGS trains. W.D. Lee, once again acting as general superintendent, employed over 50 men to work on the bridge by 5 a.m. soon afterwards, with the trestle quickly being operational again. In August of 1910, the famed Southern Pacific Railroad sent men to camp a mile east of Franklin Junction, completing a second survey of a route into Durango, although nothing would come of it, and the SP would never build a route anywhere in Colorado. In one of the RGS's funnier stories, in the fall, Superintendent W.D. Lee bought two Judas goats named Billy and Blondie to prod sheep into cars. Billy loved getting himself a Rocky Mountain high by chewing tobacco. These inseparable two traveled together and would eventually retire after many years of service to the Ritter Ranch near Dolores sometime after World War I. Heading into 1911, the Montezuma Lumber Company's boarding house at Glencoe became so popular with the crews of the RGS that the company's manager had to ask the Southern to only stop there in case of emergencies because they were not equipped to feed crews and passengers. Due to this new policy, the number of unexplained engine troubles around lunchtime at Glencoe skyrocketed. On October 5th, 1911, flooding severely damaged the DNRG's legendary Silverton branch and the line between Durango to Chama while destroying 50 miles of track and roadbed between Lizardhead to Dolores. The Great Fruit Burns Canyon, north of Rico, was totally wiped out, with one of the bridges near Newmeyer being totally destroyed. Just a few weeks later, on the 31st, service was thankfully restored between Dolores and Durango. In 1912, Telluride's engine house was put to work storing the monthly car of beer that would get shipped to the town to keep it from freezing. One day, a dead 280 locomotive had to be pushed into the roundhouse for repairs, but due to it going down a slight grade, the train ran away, and with the doors open, it and the engine pulling it crashed right into the beer car, with the alcohol getting sent flying into the river. On January 16th, after an expensive process of rebuilding the whole RGS which cost $174,000, service was restored over the line. On March 3rd, 
Five snow slides came tumbling down the mountain near Ophir, holding up two passenger trains with a wedge plow and flanger. On the sixth, a huge slide came down the mountain along the Telluride branch while 57 men were shoveling out prior rock slides, which completely put the northern half of the southern out of service. Eight more snow slides caused calamity along the line between Trout Lake and Vance Junction on the eighth, stranding passengers and freight trains. To add insult to injury, another slide ran below Ophir, killing four men and injuring another five, forcing shoveling operations to cease in fear of more casualties. Throughout the rest of the month, the RGS would be dealt with more harsh snow that would ultimately shut down the entire line, with trains getting stuck. After over two weeks of work, the line was finally reopened, and the rotary snowplows could go to work clearing the snow slides. On May 17th, an RGS train headed by locomotive number 12 and going southbound to Placerville rolled over just north of Leonard while attempting to back up the Dallas Divide. Also on that day, the DNRG's parlor car Alamosa, which the Southern was renting, along with multiple other cars rolled over, and a special RGS train carrying Superintendent W.D. Lee derailed, and later a fire started which burned most of the train except the baggage car. Heading into 1913, Superintendent W.D. Lee turned a Model T into the very first Rio Grande Southern inspection car, RGS number no. 1. On January 15th, a man named Andrew Rasmussen rebuilt Flanger number no. 2 into Plow Flanger No. 2, adding ice cutters, an operator's house, wedge plow, and air reservoir, which would increase the weight from 28,000 pounds to 40,000. In the spring of 1913, a pack of Dolores residents proposed building a new railroad between Cortez and the New Mexican town of Grants, called the Montezuma San Juan Southern, with a construction contract soon being granted. Despite this, nothing was ever built. On June 6, Superintendent Lee was riding with his wife in his inspection car when it derailed and rolled down a bank straight into Dolores's Bear Creek. Thankfully, they jumped and were only slightly injured. However, Roadmaster Gilland was not so lucky. After this, Lee's wife refused to ever sit in the car again. On July 7th, the general manager of the New Mexico Lumber Company, Edgar Biggs, visited Dolores to begin looking into building a logging railroad that would service the business's lumber holdings near Dolores. Heading into 1914, American railroads would see major changes as World War I swept the globe. Although with America staying neutral for the foreseeable future, nothing dramatic would happen on the RGS for a while. Even before entering the war, automobiles were starting to chip away at the success of the train, and the federal government Government began enacting more regulations on the industry. During the war, parlor cars were operated along the line from Ridgeway to Telluride, and the train shops at the former worked constantly to keep the aging 280s and 460s up and running. However, oftentimes the RGS opted to pay to use DNRG locomotives, leaving their own in the yards at Durango. On February 2nd, RGS Rotary No. 2 fell straight through a bridge near Stoner, which tied up the entire line. In April of that year, in order to comply with a Colorado law passed in the previous year, the Southern finished installing carbon arc headlights on 15 different locomotives, costing $2,684. A few years later, the carbon arcs were changed to incandescent headlights. On July 27th, the Cornette Creek flood in Telluride completely wiped out much of the town, destroying numerous businesses and residencies. Massive logs and boulders were sent screeching down into the area, and a woman named Mrs. Blakely was killed. In November, the Montezuma Lumber Company Railroad at Glencoe was torn up, with its freight cars and locomotive number no. one being sent to Caliente, New Mexico, due to the amount of lumber in the area being exhausted. With the company getting totally dissolved on the 16th, the mill was dismantled the following spring and sent to La Madera, New Mexico, in Rio Arena. Reba County. Sometime in 1915, a small free car spur was built three miles south of Vanadium, serving an aerial tramway from one of the above mines. Later on in the year, in October, part of a snow shed at Lizard had went up in flames, and 14 DNRG cars were unfortunately lost in the tragedy. Immediately into 1916, on January 14th, W.D. Lee went to the Florence and Cripple Creek Railroad to supervise the loading of three different locomotives that the RGS had purchased from them after the FNCC's track had been wiped out in the 1912 flood. 
Altogether, these locomotives would be the second number 20, 22, and 25. On February 1st, Bridge 64A was completely wrecked by a snowslide. As a result, it was replaced and later again around 1920 with concrete piers. On the 10th, the DNRG rented an RGS rotary snowplow to plow the Cumbres Pass line all the way to Alamosa and then down along the famous Chile line, a branch servicing New Mexico, including Santa Fe. On March 9th, the Free Florence and Cripple Creek Railroad locomotives that the RGS had purchased arrived in Durango after having a complete overhaul conducted in Alamosa and getting tested in Chama to ensure everything ran smoothly. Steam engines can be quite dangerous if something isn't done right. In 1917, everything would change for the Southern and for America. On April 6, after receiving word that Germany had attempted to convince Mexico to invade America, and with the total number of American sunken ships rising, President Woodrow Wilson convinced Congress to declare war on Germany, thus bringing the U.S. into the First World War. Railway post office cars were taken out of service on the southern end of the southern, no pun intended, and the around-the-circle tourist business on both the RGS and DNRG was put to a close, while the southern helped raise money for the war when they participated in a Liberty Bond Drive, DNRG Locomotive 240 pulled a special train across the line with the engine being draped in flags and posters. On May 25th, Roadmaster W.E. Pears was executed by an earth slide at Ames, while just a week and a half later, on June 6, a new sand dryer was installed at the train shops in Ridgeway, and a device was installed on the turntable to prevent engines from derailing while getting on or off of it. In August, after years of service to the railroad, Superintendent W.D. Lee retired. His tenure saw the line expand considerably while surviving the beginning of one of the biggest wars in history and making significant profits. With his retirement, C.D. Wolfinger would take over as superintendent of the RGS. Sometime that year, an RPO route between Ridgeway and Durango was discontinued and replaced by a new route that would last until 1927 between Ridgeway and Telluride. After closing, the line would be reopened between 1931 and 1933. After the end of the Great War, the train shops at Ridgeway were all closed and any major repairs had to be done at the DNRG's Alamosa shops. With its steep 5% grades, the Black Hawk Enterprise branch, just above Rico, was also abandoned that same year. Despite the world celebrating the end of the First World War, a new enemy would quickly enter into the arena, the Spanish Flu. The influenza spread quickly throughout the world, and soon, the Rio Grande Southern had to implement safety protocols as Colorado was hit hard by the virus, with the mining town of Silverton linked to the outside world by four different railroads, including the DNRG, losing 10% of its population. The Durango City Council implemented harsh restrictions, including mandatory quarantines on employees and passengers arriving on the Rio Grande Southern. The railroad was also required to increase sanitation. It has been well documented that railroads were an enormous help to facilitating the spread of the virus, especially during the second wave of it. As the virus continued to wreak havoc in 1919, not too much about the RGS's operations in the year are well known. We don't really have any evidence that the line suspended its operations, but it was most definitely operating under increased safety protocols. On September 19th, Ralph Peak, the engineer on DNRG locomotive number 217, was killed when the Lightner Creek trestle collapsed and the engine slipped into the water. He had attempted to cross despite the trestle being flooded as he had thought it was safe. Thankfully, his fire man, a man with the same name as President John Adams, was able to swim to safety. The 1920s would be a decade of both massive economic success and calamity, seeing the end of the Spanish flu pandemic, the Roaring Twenties, and the Great Depression. The first major event of the decade in American history was the 1920 presidential election, when due to low approval ratings, incumbent Democratic President Woodrow Wilson opted not to run for re-election, and Republican Warren Harding, a senator from Ohio running on the slogan, A Return to Normalcy, defeated Democrat James Cox in one of the largest landslides in history. Harding would die in office, and after his death, 
numerous scandals surfaced that would become known as the Teapot Dome Scandal, where many of his former officials would be convicted and imprisoned, thus damaging his legacy, and he is frequently known as one of the all-time worst presidents. Succeeding him would be Calvin Coolidge, who easily won the 1924 election in a freeway race against Democrat John Davis and progressive Robert La Follette. After a successful second term, Coolidge retired and Commerce Secretary Herbert Hoover replaced him. Despite the economy having done stellar throughout most of the decade, just a few months into his presidency, the stock markets crashed and the Great Depression began which shut down many mines and railroads. But throughout all the social change and economic upheaval, the RGS would survive. The first documented events in the line story in 1920 was in May of that year, when flooding damaged the line's tracks and locomotive number 22 rolled into the river near Dolores. In 1921, the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad was reorganized as the Denver and Rio Grande Western. In March, a freight train was wrecked near Stoner, which caused a six hour delay for a passenger train between Dolores and Rico. On April 13th, a baggage car that was part of a passenger train from Durango was overturned, but thankfully nobody was injured. Just a few days later, a southbound freight train was totaled somewhere near Dolores, with five cars getting thrown off of the track. In August of 1922, the Burnett and Clifton coal chute, situated at Ute Junction, burned down, with it getting replaced by another chute with a different design. In the fall, the RGS leased two silver to northern locals locomotives and put multiple aging C-16 engines into service thanks to the increasing stock rush business. In 1923, with the discovery of a superior ore in Africa, the mines surrounding vanadium drastically reduced their production levels and in September, the DNRGW finished converting its Farmington branch from standard gauge to narrow gauge, which resulted in oil shipments being rerouted over the RGS. In January of 1924, the US Forest Service sold over 400 million board feet of yellow pine lumber located just seven miles above Dolores to the New Mexico Lumber Company. With holdings so vast that it would take 18 years to extract the lumber, the company began constructing a railroad with grading commencing in March and track laying in April. The line would become over 43 miles long and by October the mill at McPhee began test cutting while the railroad reached its first camp, Horse Camp, in October. On August 14th, the first oil shipment from the newly narrow gauge Farmington branch was shipped over the RGS, reaching Rico on the 17th. In November, in order to handle heavier loads, 20 miles of track were replaced with heavier rail, and the RGS's buildings in Ridgeway were improved, with enhancements at the shop buildings, depot, roundhouse, and even cleaning up the ground. In January of 1925, RGS records showed an increase in profits from the previous year, with light repairs getting performed upon both the coal chutes and water tank at Rico while at some point in the year, former Superintendent W.D. Lee's inspection car was wrecked and never reconstructed. In February, oil and lumber shipments had increased to the point where the RGS had to hire six more freight crews between Durango and Rico, while in April, a coal car at Vance Junction was obliterated by a rock slide. In May, despite the RGS having had a stellar previous past few months, traffic along the line began to stagnate, with six firemen getting laid off. On June 20, Fifth, the New Mexico Lumber Company amended its 1913 charter for the railroad above Dolores, changing the name to the Colorado and Southwestern after the line had previously been named the Dolores, Paradox, and Grand Junction Railroad. In July, the oil house at Ridgeway had been rebuilt, while on August 11th, thanks to a lake bursting, Ridge 42A was washed out. Prior to its bursting, the lake had been used for irrigation. In September, livestock traffic increased and lumber shipments from Dolores skyrocketed to 15 cars a day. In October, traffic continued to increase while Ridgeway was given a new stationary boiler from Salt Lake City with the old one being rendered inadequate for the line. In December, the RGS leased four different K27 steam engines from the DNRGW to replace outdated C19 locomotives. The RGS 
U.S. would not outright own any K-27s until it bought Locomotive 455 in September of 1939, which is also the month that Hitler invaded Poland and began the Second World War. The Kalamut Fuel Company shut down the Perrins Peak Coal Mine in 1926 and abandoned the Kalamut branch, which had been leased by the RGS for the past 20 years. In April, the new K-27s began hauling all trains on the northern end of the southern, and as America's economy soared, the RGS's future continued to seem bright. In July, the amount of oil shipped from Farmington to the RGS increased to 35 cars a week, with the line expecting that number to jump to 50 by the fall. Expectations for 1927 were that the line's numbers would increase even more. On the very first day of the new year, the RGS was certified to run K-28 locomotives across the Rico to Durango portion of the line, which cleared the way for the eventual purchase of engines 455 and 461. In 1928, the last of the once great mines in Telluride closed down, and ore shipments along the RGS dropped drastically as miners moved out. In 1929, the Calumet branch, which had been abandoned in 1926, was torn up. In April, a massive mudslide came tumbling down the mountain at Ames and totally destroyed the RGS track, burying it under 50 feet of mud, which split the RGS in two. Due to this slide, oil shipments were rerouted on the DNRGW to Salida, eliminating a major source of income for the railroad. In October, in what would become one of the worst events for the railroad and mankind, the US stock market crashed and the Great Depression began. Overnight, millions of shares were rendered worthless, with thousands losing their jobs. Suddenly, the RGS's optimism vanished, and a receivership began. The RGS had to pay insane rent to the DNRGW for many such things like depots and locomotives, while also needing to come up with over $20,000 to clear the mudslide at Ames. Victor Miller took over the new receivership, keeping the Southern running until 1938. In part 4 of this series, he will clear the mudslide, restore RGS steam engines, acquire new freight cars, and most importantly, build the Galloping Geese, the most famous and endearing part of the Rio Grande Southern that you can still see today. And with that, the Southern's two decades of boom and bust, overseeing some of the most consequential events to ever happen in the history of mankind, faded into history. During the 1910s and 20s, the Rio Grande Southern dealt with great successes, but also great trials, and it survived them all. Despite worldwide calamities such as World War I, the Spanish Flu, and the Great Depression, the RGS would continue to survive while keeping the farmers and miners who relied upon it afloat. The people of the San Juan Mountains relied on railroads like the Silverton Northern, Denver and Rio Grande Western, and Rio Grande Southern to transport their goods, their people, and fuel their economies. Whether America was doing good or bad, the RGS was there for it all, making people's lives better no matter what. In part 4, which will be the most expansive documentary of mine yet, we'll cover the RGS's story through the rest of the Great Depression in the 1930s, World War II in the 1940s, its eventual abandonment in the 1950s, and what remains of it today. And though it would eventually die, we'll see how the RGS continues to live on today, whether it's Locomotive 42 in Durango's train museum or in Bill Scooby's model railroad layout and it's through this legacy that the memory of the Rio Grande Southern will live on forever.
Yeah, the 1910s and 20s were one hell of a time for the Rio Grande Southern, weren't they? Despite numerous world catastrophes, the line would continue to survive and thrive and make major impacts on the people of Colorado, despite it not being as big as the Denver and Rio Grande Western or Colorado and Southern. The RGS gave viewers a unique way to see the world from the inside of vintage coaches being pulled by gorgeous steam locomotives. And today, you can still see the line's remains, raw, untamed, rugged, and beautiful. And thanks to my wonderful viewers such as yourself, the Southern Legacy will last for all eternity, no matter what happens in the world. I'm Zane Lewis, thanks for watching. Zane here. Thank you so much for watching part 3 of the history of the Rio Grande Southern Railroad and even more for staying till the end of the video. I'm currently in high school and have a part time job and these documentaries generally take around 100 hours to make so I sincerely appreciate the support. In part 4 we will cover the final part of the line's history throughout the Great Depression, World War II, its abandonment in the 1950s and the awesome amount of remains of the line today. After this I will put all the documentaries together into one combined video, hopefully sometime next year, but I will have to re-record the entire audio for part one, as my mic in that video only came out on one side of your headphones. But before I make part four, I will make a documentary about the epic ghost towns of St. John, Colorado, near Montezuma and Breckenridge, and the mines surrounding it. I'm really excited to make this one, because I narrated part of it in person, and I hiked over 13 miles and an elevation gain of 3,000 feet to see the town, and the top of the mountain to see its mines. That was one hell of an adventure, and hopefully we can have it out in January or February. As always, if you would like to know the progress of this series or any of my documentaries, leave a comment and I will respond. You can also support the channel and help me pay for gas to see the things I photograph in these videos by donating to my Patreon. Link will be in the description. You'll also get exclusive content and behind the scenes footage. Please be patient with me, as I have limited time and I use that time to make the absolute best product possible. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.